I'm searching for a place. I'm searching for people. I'm searching for a purpose. At River Glen, we believe that we are better together and there is no better way to do this than in a group. That's why during this series, we're offering what we call Group Link. At Group Link, you can discover which one is the place for you. If you are brand new to groups and you want to explore the Christian faith because you have questions or you are looking for a way to try groups for the first time, the Alpha Course is a great place to start. Alpha starts every week by eating a meal together with your group, watching a short Alpha video, and discussing the topic around the table. There's no homework, and Alpha is a safe place to ask questions as you explore faith together with your group. If you have already taken the Alpha course or have been in groups before, and you are ready to enrich your faith through an interactive group experience, Rooted is for you. Over the course of 10 weeks, your Rooted group will discuss what God is revealing to you through the readings, journaling, and prayer. You will also take part in three experiences outside your regular meeting time, a prayer experience, a service experience, and a celebration. I didn't know how normal it felt to have all this credit card debt. We started asking ourselves more and more, what's truly important? Every time I got a credit card, I thought, wow, they're extending me credit. I almost thought that they were doing me a service. I really wanted to take charge. I wanted the money that, that I made to work for us. It made us really work together. Our first objective was to pay down the truck payment. And I'm gonna guess it was six to eight months later, we paid off you know, ten to $12,000. I have paid off over $18,000 worth of debt. We paid off about $55,000. And we're debt free now. It only took us a year to take care of that. We're not perfect, we still have a long way to go, but the peace is unbelievable. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to River Glen. We're really glad that you're here with us today. And to get started with our services, we're going to sing a few songs together. You know, music has a pretty incredible way of drawing our attention to someone uh, or something. And this morning, we want to sing music that will bring our attention to Jesus and what he's doing in and through us. Throughout scripture, uh, especially in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus referred to as the lion and the lamb. And you're going to see some of those references here in this first song that we're going to sing. When he is called the lion, that is a reference to his kingship, that he is the king of kings and he is the lord of lords. But when you see him referred to as the lamb, that's referring to his sacrifice on the cross. He was the sacrificial lamb that paid the price of our sin for us in our place. So he is both the lion and the lamb. So we're gonna sing that song together to get started. So I wanna invite you to stand with us and we'll sing. the 
have one more song to sing together, but before we do that, why don't we take just a moment and say hi to the people around us.
weekend that we gather, we take time to remember the most significant act of generosity and love this world has ever seen. And that was the act of God sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die in our place for our sins on the cross. But it didn't end there. Jesus was buried, and three days later, he rose again from the grave. So he defeated the power that death had over life. And now we can look forward to a future when we will be completely restored and redeemed. And we remember this by taking communion together. We take the bread that represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, and we take the juice that represents the blood that was shed for us. So I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll remember him in this way. Father, we thank you for your profound and deep and unfathomable love for us. We thank you that you were so generous that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. When we could not pay the penalty that sin required of us, Jesus did it in our place. And God, the, it's hard to imagine, but you died for every single one of us. So Father, may we understand that we are united in this truth that we have all had the ransom paid for us. And that, Father, we have freedom in Jesus' name. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is great to be here with each and every one of you. You know, my name is Amy, and uh, if you're newer here, I would love to meet you. I'm going to be out at the Welcome Center immediately after service. Uh, I can answer any questions that you have about River Glen. Um, I can tell you all about us, and I actually, I've got a really awesome gift that I get to give to you just for being our guest today. Well, every weekend here at River Glen, we celebrate, we give thanks to God, we praise, and we also worship in a time of offering. So as the bags are passed today, I just want to encourage each and every one of you to pray over our generosity here at River Glen, that we continue to impact people's lives, and that we continue to be able to share the message of Jesus by fueling our ministries and our outreach. So... The other thing that I wanted to kind of tell you was a little bit about some bad news and some good news. Now, the bad news is that summer is ending. Groups, the summer groups are coming to an end. I am so sorry. I know that's really, really bad news. But here is the good news. The good news is that our fall groups, our new fall groups, are getting ready to launch this September, and you can sign up th for them today. You can go on our website. You can say, yes, I want to join. Or you can go out to our Connect Wall, and we'll have a team of people there that can help you out. In fact, if you pull out this insert from your program, Program. You, you, it tells you about two new groups that are ready to sign up for today. The first one is Alpha. Um, this group is great if maybe you have questions about faith or you're newer to groups. This would be the perfect group for you to join. The second one on the other side is Rooted. Now, Rooted is great for people who have been involved in groups for a while. Uh, maybe you want to go a little bit deeper in your faith, in um, interactive group experiences. This one is the perfect one for you to join. Uh, so now over the next couple weeks, maybe you go back and forth and you aren't really sure which group is right for you. We have an event coming up called Group Link, and that is September 7th and 8th. At Group Link, we're going to have group leaders from lots of different groups. We've got life groups, we've got a mom's group, we've got Financial Peace University, and many other individual groups that meet in homes and here at church. You can find out more, you can meet the group leaders at Group Link, and I'm sure we can find the perfect group for you. If you haven't picked up, Groups are really important. We feel like it's the best place for you to connect, you can grow in relationships, and you can grow your faith in a group. So finally, the last thing I'm going to tell you about, we are going to be doing our very, very last summer event 
this afternoon at our Pewaukee campus, and I want to extend that invitation to each and every one of you. It's from noon until 2, and this event is a community event where we get to thank all of those, all those local superheroes that serve us each and every day. We have the police coming, firefighters, EMS is going to be there, the K-9 unit. Stop by and give them a very special thank you. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoy the rest of our service. Thanks. morning and uh, welcome to River Glen. Great to see you and, and so good to be uh, with all of you. Welcome everybody here in Waukesha on the other side of the camera in Pewaukee and, and those of you online. Uh, welcome and uh, great to have you uh, joining with us and I hope you've been having a good summer. How many of you attended the uh, Cutler Park concert on uh, Friday night? Yeah, wasn't that a great time? Yeah, beautiful night, uh, great music and I really, really enjoyed uh, that summer uh, evening, and um, our families had a great uh, summer. Our daughter Taylor uh, and her husband John gave birth, welcomed uh, baby Emily into the, into the world July 12th, and it's been a lot of fun to be part of that and to watch her grow, and it's going to be really fun to watch her go through the different phases that kids go through. Kids all go through phases of uh, uh, childhood. Uh, uh, for example, there's the uh, not yes, uh, but no uh, phase. And not yours, but mine, 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 my face. And uh, I don't want daddy. I only want mommy. Yeah. I remember when our kids were little, we've got three kids. And when they were little and my wife would go away for a few days, my kids would mope around the house. Where's mom? When's mom, you know, coming back? And I'm like, well, who am I? You know, I'm cooking food for you guys, changing your diapers, wiping your bottom, uh, reading you stories. Maybe some of you dads uh, can can relate. And the I want mommy stage can last a very long time, even to into adulthood. Yeah. Uh, but kids go through that. And then uh, the next phase that they go through is uh, I want to do it uh, all by myself. Maybe some of you have kids in that phase uh, right now. They want to dress themselves all by, my, all by themselves and doesn't really match, but it's kind of cute. They f- want to feed themselves. I remember our kids when they were little, we just put a drop cloth around them. And then when they were done, just throw it in the washer. Girls in particular want to put on makeup by themselves. Hopefully that's not permanent uh, marker. Kids go through the do-it-myself phase. If only the do-it-myself phase continued to uh, paying for college, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. But this desire to do it myself starts very young. And the truth is we never outgrow it. We still place a high value on doing it myself as adults. For example, we want, to, we want to make it vocationally all by myself. We want to make it financially all by myself. We love to celebrate stories and congratulate ourselves for all the times that we've pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps and just did it on my uh, own. When the French philosopher Alex de Tocqueville came to America to observe our culture, he noticed the rugged individualism. As an outsider, it's interesting to read his observation about America. Each of them, he said, withdrawn into himself, is almost unaware of the fate of the rest. Mankind for him consists in his children and his personal friends. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, they are near enough, but he does not notice them. He touches them, but feels nothing. He exists in and for himself. When I read that, I thought, wow, man, that's a fascinating description of some of the issues that we face in our American culture in the 21st century. But then I discovered he actually said that in 1840. We've we've always celebrated rugged individualism. 
in America. And that brings us back to this uh, series called Bumper Sticker Theology. The big idea of this series is that many of these Christian sayings that we think are good sayings, that we think have good theology, actually are not really based on the Bible. We uh, are are so, uh, uh, we we put so much value on uh, independence and uh, doing it myself that when we uh, hear the saying that we're going to talk about today, God helps those who help themselves, we just kind of nod our head and we go, yeah, yeah, God does help us when we help our, our, ourselves. And that's the saying that we're going to talk about uh, today. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anybody and uh, ask for a show of hands, but most people actually think that this saying comes from the uh, Bible. I know you tend to see this maybe on Facebook or maybe in a tweet or we just say it, we hear it, uh, and we think that it's from uh, the, 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 the Bible. In fact, the Barnard Research Group did a survey and found that seven out of ten people in America I think this is a direct quote from, strict, from uh, Scripture. But why do you think we continue to repeat it and say it and believe it when it's not actually in the Bible? Well, I can think of a few reasons. One reason is that we believe that, that somehow we made it on our own. And uh, we forget how much help we receive from other uh, people. And we think, you know, if other people just did what we did, then they would make it too. I think another reason that we say it is that uh, we don't feel responsible for helping other people. This, this saying, God helps those who help themselves, clearly lets us off the hook. We look around and we see people that have needs and we think, They wouldn't be in that needy situation if they would have taken the initiative to help themselves. And occasionally we say God helps those who help themselves out of frustration, maybe maybe with people that we think are lazy or taking advantage of the system. Now, it might surprise you to learn that the origin of this saying goes back long before we had bumper stickers. We can go all the way back to the 5th century B.C. Maybe some of you are familiar with the writings of Aesop. Maybe that rings a bell. Maybe in high school you had to read some of Aesop's fables. There's a line in the story by Aesop where a character prays to the Greek god Hercules and asks for help. And Hercules responds with this charge to get to work because the gods help them that help themselves. Asap wrote that over 2,500 years ago. But how did this saying gain such popularity in America? Well, credit goes to one of our founding fathers, Ben Franklin. In his almanac in 1736, Ben Franklin wrote, God helps those who help themselves. And it has stayed in our thinking ever since. Now, that might explain the popularity of this saying in America. But why do you think so many Christians believe that this saying comes from uh, the Bible. Well, I'm not exactly sure, but it does sound similar to something that Paul wrote to the uh, church in the city of Thessalonica. Paul writes, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now, uh, let me give you some context, okay? I think that'll help us understand the original meaning of this uh, verse. Back in the first century, in the early church, when somebody said yes to Jesus, They might end up losing their wealth, losing their business, losing their home, maybe losing their family. And so people developed a bond, a close relationship in their church family. And so the church would have this common fund, kind of like a benevolence fund, that everybody shared and had access to as needed. But Paul saw that some people in the church had stopped working and contributing to the common fund. And they relied on the work and the contribution of others. And that's why Paul calls them out in this verse for their laziness. And so Paul's not saying everybody needs to go out, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and and make it on their own. No, Paul sets up some healthy boundaries by saying it's a good practice for us to help each other when we're down. We need to rally around uh, people who can't help themselves. We should do that. But this is not an excuse for laziness or not working. If you don't work when you could work, you're mentally and physically capable, um, then you don't eat, according to Paul. So Paul doesn't say God helps those who help themselves. No, this means something much different. Paul forbids laziness. And so if Scripture doesn't say God helps those 
who help themselves. And God doesn't ex- expect us to do it on our own. Scripture doesn't mandate a self-help theology. Then what does the Bible say about who God helps and how God helps? Well, I think there's a lot of places that we could turn in Scripture. Maybe the best place to start would be in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. God inspired the author to fill these Proverbs with all sorts of wisdom. In in chapter 31, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the author recounts the sage advice of his mother. You can think of chapter 31 as one long, my mom always told me, kind of like Forrest Gump. Maybe you remember the movie Forrest Gump. He was always saying, you know, my mom always told me. And maybe that'll help you remember this chapter of Proverbs because this chapter begins with my mom always told me that good leaders don't chase after women. Good leaders don't drink too much alcohol. Good leaders don't numb their feelings. But then we get down to verses 8 and 9 where the author, remembering the wisdom of his mother and inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, make sure you speak out on behalf of those who have no voice and defend all those who have been passed over. Uh, Make sure to open your mouth, judge fairly, and stand up for the rights of the afflicted and the poor. Now, Now think about this. There are many places in the Bible where it tells us to be quiet, to be still, to keep our mouth closed, right? But this is not one of them. This is different. Two times in this scripture, God urges us to say something, to open our mouths, and to stand up for those who need help. Maybe some of you have heard of uh, Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace is a Christ follower and the founder of an organization called Sojourner. Sojourners, if you're not familiar with it, speaks up for those who are unable to speak up for themselves. And uh, take a look at what he says about the founding of this uh, organization. He says, one of our first activities was to find every verse of scripture about the poor, wealth and poverty, and social justice. We found more than 2,000 texts that we then cut out of an old Bible. And when we looked at the Bible without those verses, we were left with a Bible full of holes. Even a casual reading of Scripture clearly, clearly reveals that God cares for the vulnerable. God cares deeply for those who need an advocate, for those who need our our voice. Maybe they don't have a voice, or maybe they're shouting as loud as they can. And nobody is listening uh, to them. Reminds me of a documentary that came out a few years ago called Among the Discarded. Uh, Trent Soto went and lived for 30 days in Los Angeles on Skid Row as a homeless person. He said it was one of the most fascinating and difficult experiences of his life. In the film, he recounts that surprisingly, the most difficult part for him involved the psychological pain of people walking by without acknowledging him. People walk by without acknowledging him at all. He felt passed over, ignored, discarded. And he said within a few days, it made a devastating impact on his self-esteem. Nobody made eye contact with him. No one acknowledged his existence. That's why in this scripture in Proverbs, not only does it say that God helps those who help themselves is not true, It tells us to to, to open our mouths and to speak up and to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. The voiceless, the passed over, the poor, the oppressed, the homeless. Why? Because God loves everybody equally. As much as God loves you, he loves people in these conditions. And if you're with us today and you feel uh, voiceless, ignored, discarded, left out, poor, like one of these people listed in the book of of Proverbs, would you let us know? Because we have ministries designed to come alongside and to help and to stand up and to speak up uh, for you. Stop at the connect wall in the lobby after the service if you'd like to find out more, if you'd like some help. But it's important for us to understand that God calls all of us, I want you to notice this phrase, God calls every one of us to judge fairly. Very important. So what do you think it means to judge fairly? Uh, That phrase in this uh, scripture in Proverbs. It means that we look beyond the face value. When we see somebody struggling in poverty, experiencing uh, homelessness, judging fairly means we don't just see them as the sum total of their choices, but we seek to understand influences beyond their control 
that contributed to their situation. Uh, here, here's what I mean. In, in a book called Outliers, uh, Malcolm uh, Gladwell uh, tells several stories that are examples of one point. One point, and that is that ad- advantage is accumulated. Advantage is accumulated. Gladwell says those who are successful, in other words, are most likely to be given the kinds of special opportunities that lead to further success. And uh, he gives uh, several examples. My favorite, one of my favorite examples in the book is about uh, hockey. Yeah, how to become a great hockey player in Canada. Now, you might think, well, that would take a lot of effort, a lot of training and practice and skill, right? Well, it turns out that in any elite group of hockey players in Canada, 40% of them were born between January and March, 30% between April and June, 20% between July and September, 10% between October and December. And and you wonder why. Why are 40% of all great hockey players born between January and March? Gladwell writes, uh, the explanation for this is quite simple. It has nothing to do with astrology, which is good because we don't believe in that. Nor is there anything magical about the first three months of the year It's simply that in Canada, the eligibility cutoff for age class hockey is January 1st. A boy who turns 10 on January 2nd then could be playing alongside someone who doesn't turn 10 until the end of that year, December 31st. And at that age, in pre-adolescence, a 12-month gap in age represents an enormous difference in physical maturity. And so if you're a boy uh, born in, in, in Canada between January and March and you want to become a great hockey player... You have an advantage through no effort of your own. Now, I know that might seem like a silly example, but if something as simple, think about it, as the month in which you're born makes the difference in who becomes a great hockey player, a successful hockey star or not, how much more might mental illness or socioeconomics or race increase or decrease, or, or decrease the access to what Gladwell calls the special opportunities that lead to further success. Let's take a look at a few more outlier stats and how they might impact someone's success and maybe consider how there are some people who might need our help. How about this first one here? 25% of the homeless population suffers from mental illness. How might that affect their ability to obtain Stable housing. I wonder if we might uh, judge those incarcerated less harshly if we knew that 60% of young men in uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa who were in foster care had been convicted of a crime. Would we uh, view uh, prostitutes differently if we knew that 80% of those in prostitution were sexually assaulted? as children. Judging fairly means that we recognize there are factors beyond simply just pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps that influence outcomes positively and negatively. Judging fairly means that we recognize that we didn't just make it on our own and neither will others. Here's the true saying that I want you to take with you uh, today, that God helps those who can't help themselves. That's the truth right there. God helps those who can't help themselves. And how do I know that's true? Uh, Because God helped me when I couldn't help myself. When I was far from God, God came after me, dead in my sin. And Jesus came after me. Apostle John says it so beautifully in his first letter. He says, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. God sent Jesus to create a way for us, for us to find our way back to him. And God sent other people to point us in the direction toward him. That's how God helped you when you couldn't help yourself. And because God has helped us, John goes on to say, this is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice 
real love. Now, I don't think John is saying that, you know, if you don't help those in need, you know, God's love disappears from this world. Or if you don't help someone in need, God doesn't love you anymore. No, that, that's not what he means. He says it's inconceivable for Jesus followers to say, we love God and then refuse to help someone in need. It's inconceivable. And when we don't help, it's like the evidence of God's love in our life disappears because God helps those who can't help themselves. And oftentimes God does it through his people. And when we help people who can't help themselves, it makes God's love visible. And so I've got a couple uh, opportunities. I've got a couple challenges for you uh, today to practice real love, to give a voice to those who don't have a voice, to help those who can't help themselves. But before I give you these uh, challenges, I want you to see a brief video about how God has used River Glen Church uh, to help those in need this summer. Take a look. Interacting with the Jamaicans was a lot of fun. Um, they're very like just outgoing, talkative. They'll talk to anybody. There was a sense of community and the Holy Spirit just working through us constantly. When you get to do um, kingdom work, when you work for, for God and, and spreading his news and his gospel and what he is and what he, what he stands for, and seeing people learn that and seeing people hear that news is just, there's nothing like it. It's kind of undescribable. To reach out to the world is such a wonderful experience that is just so hard to put into words. I think everybody needs to experience it for themselves. Being able to serve, I think you get a lot more back when you do that. And just being able to kind of see the impact, um, the actual impact that you have on those kids, on those teachers, in that whole community. All the teachers and all the, the staff was always just like, thank you so much. River Glen is just so, so helpful. And we, we love that they're always here, always serving us. And they continually said thank you. I mean, we have the resources and we have people. And so it's an amazing opportunity for us just to give back um, and be able to serve people, um, whether it's food, whether it's you know games or just hanging out with them or doing whatever we can for them. Um, it's, it's really encouraging. We sent a team to Jamaica this summer, and uh, they had a wonderful opportunity to help those in need. And I hope someday it, it, that you'll have the opportunity to go on one of our uh, mission trips. And then we also showed you some footage about our partnership with a local elementary school in Waukesha, Whittier Elementary. I attended an event there that we held a couple of months ago, and it encouraged me. It, it touched me. How many teachers and, and staff members came up to express appreciation to our church for our help. Here, so here's the first challenge. I got two challenges, and I, and I really, I hope you'll do both of these, okay? Here's the first one. Many of the students in this school at Whittier uh, need our help, and their families need our help, especially at the beginning of this school year. And so we're doing this event uh, next month called the Super Cool Back to School event on Saturday, September uh, 28th. And here's how we need your help. We want to give each student a new outfit for the beginning of the school year. And this is a really big deal for these kids and for their families. Uh, they get to come to this event and uh, they get to pick out their outfit. And uh, it's, a, it's a source of joy for them, but it meets an important need for clothing. But we, we need your help to make it happen. And so we've got these blue bags, okay? And they're on a table right in the middle of the, the lobby. And uh, we would love for you to pick one of these up. There's some simple instructions attached to it that tells you some guidelines on, on how to buy an outfit, what kind of outfit, what sizes, and so forth. Put the outfit in the bag. It's real simple. And then we ask you to return it to the Contribute Corner by Sunday, September 15th. Wouldn't it be great to give every student at Whittier a new outfit uh, for the beginning of the uh, school year. And then we also need lots of help, lots of volunteers for the event on uh, Saturday, September, September 28th. 20 volunteers to help with the, the, the carnival games, 20 more volunteers to help with the inflatable obstacle course, 10 more volunteers to uh, provide free uh, back-to-school haircuts, and uh, many more volunteers. You can actually go to this link 
Uh, it's on our website under uh, events. And you can see all the different volunteer opportunities. You can do this right now. You can take out your phone and uh, you can go ahead and sign up uh, to volunteer. Because Jesus helped us when uh, we couldn't help ourselves. And this is a wonderful opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people in our uh, community. All right, here's the second uh, challenge. And uh, let me introduce it this way. Uh, A couple uh, weeks ago, I was on a vacation and uh, I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to visit another church. I like to do that periodically uh, a few times a year just to see how God's working in other churches. And so I'm deciding, okay, what church am I going to visit this uh, Sunday? And I got this crazy idea to uh, go to the church where I grew up attending in West Dallas. Now, it's a different church that owns the building, but it's the same building where I grew up attending a church. So I, I drove over there in uh, West Dallas, and I almost didn't go in because I realized, I, as I saw people entering, that uh, all, uh, all the men were wearing uh, coats and ties. And uh, I had like a T-shirt on. Yeah, so I'm way underdressed. And so I took about a 30-second uh, time out in my car to muster up my courage, and I decided I'm going for it. And I'm glad I did. The people were so friendly and uh, welcoming. And it amazed me. I hadn't been in this church for 35 years, and it looked exactly the same. (laughs) I mean, it brought back so many memories. I saw the baptistry uh, where I got baptized, uh, sat in the pews, same pews that I sat with my family, sat with my parents. And it just reminded me where I came from. And it reminded me how I have received So much help, so much spiritual help in in my life. And it reminded me that many years ago, before my birth, when my parents got married, they were not Jesus followers. They did not know Jesus, but their next-door neighbors attended this church and invited uh, my parents. And that invitation changed everything in my family. And I'm forever grateful for the way that God used this church. And so here's the second uh, challenge. We're calling September 7th and 8th. We're calling it Show Up Weekend. And I I not only want you to show up, I want you to show up that weekend and invite five people to come with you that weekend. Five people that don't have a church home. Who are five people that need your help to find Jesus? Your invitation might make a huge, it might change everything. It might change, it might change their eternity. We're launching a new series that weekend called Love Does, uh, in, inspired by a book by uh, Bob Goff. And uh, it's going to be a great series. It's going to teach us about building better relationships. And it's going to have application for everyone. Now, when you walked in today, you were given a little packet that looks like this. I want you to go ahead and take that out. And if you didn't get one, uh, just raise your hand. We've got some people walking around, and uh, they'll get one of these uh, to you. It's a, uh, a packet that's got five, uh, in, uh, five uh, uh, pieces uh, to uh, invitation pieces. There's what I'm looking for that you can give to these uh, five people. If you open the front, there's five blanks. And uh, that's where we want you to write down the names of five people that you're going to pray for. And you're going to invite them to show up weekend on uh, September 7th and uh, 8th. I don't, you, you can't see it. I've got my five. I wrote, I wrote down my five. Already, And I know it takes some courage to invite people. Sometimes we're afraid people are going to say no. But surveys show that most unchurched people would say yes if they were invited to uh, attend uh, church. I remember we did something a few years ago similar to this, uh, except that we, we challenged people to invite 10 people, which that was a stretch for me. And so I remember I'm, in, I'm at McDonald's, and uh, I gave an invitation because I invited the, the lady that took my order at McDonald's, and then I forgot about it. And uh, I was so surprised uh, when she showed up in the lobby uh, that weekend. Your invitation might make a huge difference. And the invitation, it doesn't have to be perfectly worded. I mean, something like, uh, you know, would you be interested in coming with me? My my church has really encouraged me. It's really helped me. I love my church. Uh, We're beginning a new series on developing better relationships. Uh, Would you be interested in visiting And uh, you can just give them the invitation uh, piece because so many people need our help finding Jesus. Maybe your invitation will be the first domino uh, that that causes the rest of them to fall. So think about your your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, or maybe it's somebody um, who used to attend here. Maybe they've wandered away. Invite them back. Also think about the type of people that you run into each day that you may not know as well. 
but you could extend an invitation to them as, as well. You can even get creative. You could uh, go to Starbucks and use the drive through and, and uh, pay for the person's coffee in the drive through line uh, behind you and hand the uh, Starbucks barista one of these invitation pieces to give to the customer when they uh, drive up and they hear that their drink is free. You could do this at a restaurant, give a, leave a generous tip for the server at the restaurant and leave one of these uh, invitation uh, pieces. But just make sure that uh, you, just make sure you, that, that uh, uh, you leave the uh, invite card uh, with the tip, never as the tip, okay? You don't want to do that, all right? And uh, you can also leverage social media. Social media opens up a whole new bunch of people. What a great use of technology. You can invite people who live in different parts of the country because they can go online and uh, connect and uh, watch our, our service. We live stream our services every uh, Sunday uh, morning. Remember, God helps those who help themselves is a bumper sticker saying that is not true. God, the opposite is true. God helps those who cannot help themselves people like you and people like me, and we can honor our God who helped us by helping other people. So let's go all in and uh, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's put together this event at, at uh, Whittier Elementary and, and help others uh, through that partnership at the uh, back to school event. And let's, let's help five people, each of us help five people by inviting them to come to uh, show up weekend, September 7th and 8th. We can't help everyone, but every one of us can help someone. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to give you a minute. We're going to have some music, and uh, go ahead and take out a pen and begin to write down uh, names, five names of people that you're going to pray for, and you're going to invite them to show up weekend, and then our team is going to lead us in a final song. Let me pray for us. God, I confess that too often I just rush by and I don't really see people and I don't really speak up like I should. I, I, I judge unfairly. God, would you forgive me and would you forgive us for the times that we walk through this world without your eyes and without your heart? And God, I pray that you would transform us. May we never forget that when we couldn't help ourselves, you helped us. And may that be the motivation for us to turn and ask, okay, God, who can I help today? Who can I carry your love to? God, may we become agents of your love all over Waukesha and Pewaukee and Milwaukee so that more and more people can find the love that they so desperately need in a relationship with you. God, would you, would you help us in these uh, next, next few moments? Would you bring to our minds people, names of people that people that need you that we can invite to show up weekend. Give us courage to, to write their name down and then to speak up and invite them. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand for our final song together.
Island today. Why don't you meet us out in the lobby to get involved in the back to school event and show up weekend. Hope to see you at the Welcome Center if you're new. Have a great week.